Good evening. How is everyone tonight? Good. <laughs> my name is Kathleen Webb, and it is my pleasure to offer you a warm welcome to tonight's address on behalf of the University of Dayton and the UD Speaker Series. The mission of the University of Dayton Speaker Series is to serve as a catalyst for purposeful and critical discussions of contemporary issues through dynamic public presentations and related programming. Our series theme this year is Perspectives on Peace. This evening's speaker promises to contribute powerfully to the series mission and to help us approach our theme from the perspective of the common bonds we share through the miracle of books and manuscripts that come to us by way of paper. And I wish I could say I wrote that line, but actually our speaker wrote that line. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. I especially want to welcome all those students for whom this is the first major speaker event that you've attended on campus. I encourage you to settle in and open your minds for a thought-provoking evening. And please do plan on staying for the brief question and answer period that will follow Mr. Basbane's formal remarks. I also want to offer special recognition for those of you who come from the Dayton community to campus this evening. We value your partnership as we commit together to engaging in purposeful and critical discussions. We hope you'll come back again a lot. As a matter of fact, I invite you all to join us on Tuesday, November 11th to hear our next speaker, Sherman Alexi, a Native American author, poet, and filmmaker. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like you to all take a moment to silence all noise-making devices so that we can enjoy Mr. Basbane's talk uninterrupted. Oops. Nicholas Basbanes is here at the University of Dayton to help open the University Library's exhibit titled Imprints and Impressions, Milestones in Human Progress, Highlights from the Rose Rare Book Collection. I can't think of a more appropriate speaker for this opening. Besides being a colleague of Stuart, the generous collector who has loaned us his books for the exhibit, Mr. Basbanes is the author of nine works of cultural history with particular emphasis on various aspects of books and book culture. His first book, A Gentle Madness, Bibliophiles, Bibliomanes, and the Eternal Passion for, the, for Books, was a finalist in 1995 for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction, and was named a New York Times Notable Book of the Year. His most recent book, On Paper, The Everything of Its 2,000-Year History, which we'll hear a little bit more about tonight, I think, was the recipient of a National Endowment for the Humanities Research Fellowship and was one of three finalists for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction for 2014. It was also named as a notable book by the American Library Association, of particular importance to me as a librarian, one of the best books of the year by Booklist, Mother Jones, and Bloomberg News. Some of his other books include Patience and Fortitude, a Splendor of Letters, Books and Its Reader, Editions and Impressions, and A World of Letters. Nicholas Basbanes was an award-winning investigative reporter during the early 1970s and literary editor of the Worcester Sunday Telegram from 1978 to 1991. During the 1990s, he wrote a column on books and authors that was syndicated nationally in 30 newspapers. He lectures widely on a variety of subjects and has reviewed books and written op-ed pieces for numerous publications. He currently writes a featured column for Fine Books and Collections magazine. And we hope he'll say a little bit something nice about the University of Dayton and our, our exhibit in that column. There's a little plug. <laughs> he and his wife, Constance, live in Massachusetts. Please join me in welcoming Nicholas Basbanes. Thank you very much. It's, wow, what a turnout, 250 people, all here tonight to celebrate books, books on paper for the most part, but really you're here to celebrate books. I, and young people, I look around and are, it's not just people of my generation who, uh, who grew up with the printed book, but younger people, students who really believe in the book as a coalescence of human intentions. That's kind of a refrain you'll hear from me often. What is a book? I mean, when you think of if, if it's uh, uh, gatherings of paper between hard covers, okay, that's fine. But what's in the book and what does it do for culture, for people, for history, for literature, 
And I look at these nine images here for the, uh, actually, we're, oh, we do, we do have my pictures up there. Okay, that's, that's a grab that I got from the website for the uh, exhibition. It's nine images. Uh, all of them have, all of them except one notable exception, it is notable, I'll get to it uh, in due course, but come to us by way of paper. The one exception, of course, is the Book of the Dead, which is on papyrus. Uh, that's the case because 2,000 years ago there was no paper, certainly in Egypt. Uh, Stuart is an amazing collector. He's perfect for me. This exhibition is, I can't believe how perfect it is for me. Kathy mentioned nine books. Well, every one of those books has, in one way or another, really celebrated the book as a material object, as an artifact. And not only the book, but the people who gather them, collect them, preserve them, pass them on. Uh, you know, we, we talk about bibliomaniacs, and I think Stuart will acknowledge that he probably has that particular, uh, I don't want to call it a disease, but you know, I think I told, I did mention to this group I spoke to this afternoon that bibliomania is the only acknowledged ailment in the DSM-4 or 5, which is the manual of, uh, of recognized, <laughs> it's funny because really, uh, when you ask people who have the disease if they want to be cured, there are no cures for it. That are <laughs> and and I'm, from what I've seen, this man is just, get, this is what's scary. There, you've seen 50 books here, and, and really it's a powerhouse exhibition. Uh, uh, that's 50 out of about 2,000 that we're talking about. Uh, and I'll just anticipate a question, have I ever seen anything like it? Uh, not here, not, not, I mean here meaning in the United States, uh, not in libraries that I've visited, exhibitions that I've written about, and certainly not gathered by one individual. And every one of these books has something to say, something to, something to uh, establish, something to, to really make us think about what has happened in our culture, in our history. And they've all come to us by way of, by way of paper for the most part. Uh, my first book, A Gentle Madness, we talked about that. The Guiding Premise, all right, it was wonderful stories about people who gathered books, who became uh, obsessed by them. But the guiding premise for me in that book was to celebrate people who more or less preserved culture, who gathered things that in many instances would have been irretrievably lost if it were not, if it were not for the passion and dedication of collectors. Now, I, I know I used to get a, a vacant and dull look, you know, the collector is saving civilization. Well, trust me. And if you read my book, A Gentle Madness, you'll see multiple uh, examples of that across the board. And Stuart is in that tradition. And so really, to be able to come and honor him and to really speak at this exhibition is a great, is a great honor for me. But in subsequent books, I had a book called Every Book Its Reader, which I think Kathy mentioned. Uh, the whole premise of that book got its inspiration from an exhibition that was in England, uh, uh, mounted in England at the British Museum in 1963 called Printing in the Mind of Man, and it was a gathering of about 500 books gathered by multiple collectors and institutions uh, and brought together, and the whole premise was books that helped change the nature of the course of history over, over the 500 years of printing in the West. And that really g gave me the idea to do a book that followed that example, and what Stewart has done as a collector is to follow in that tradition. Another of my books, A Splendor of Letters, had as a chapter the various writing surfaces that had been used through history. You know, we think of paper, well paper, fine. That's been the medium in the West for five or 600 years, longer than that in the Middle East, and much longer than that in Asia, where it was invented 2,000 years ago. But books have come to us by clay tablets, by papyrus scrolls, on stone, on bamboo, on silk, every imaginable thing that was at hand and that could be used to receive the magic of writing which is really a, a, the unique uh, feature of the human species is that we not only sp can communicate with words, but that we can record our thoughts uh, on various media. But, so it's, it seemed to me that after having written a number of books about book culture, book people, the next logical step would be to write about the stuff of transmission. And so I turned to paper, and I really thought that this book would be yet another for me celebration of the book as an artifact, this time looking at the material, the materiality of the book. But a funny thing happened, which is, Kathy mentioned that I uh, had an earlier career as an investigative journalist. I do believe in following the stories. I like to go where the material takes me. And once I got into this book, and it took me eight years, I had a contract, it was supposed to be, this was, book was supposed to be out five years ago, but an amazing thing happened. You know, this, this subject took on a life of its own. Uh, I, I became enamored with the subject itself, paper. 
this invention that we know precisely where it, where it was invented, when, by whom, and we can follow the migration of paper. And I'll get to it in some of the, some of the slides about the globe over 1,800 years. We know country by country where it arrived and the things that it did. So it just seemed natural for me, and I'm just going to start with, there we go. Uh, these are my, <clears throat> this is the hardcover copy of my book on the left with the Carnegie Medal. Thank you very much, Carnegie Corporation. I wish it was gold, but silver's good. I'll take it. Uh, there were 700 books uh, considered, so I'll take one out of three. Not bad. And the, on the right, of course, is the paperback edition. Uh, they really never ask authors what you want for jackets. They just go ahead and do it. But they did say if there was something that I would like them to consider, I said, you know, for once, let's not have any illustration of any, any sort. Let's let, let type and the suggestion of paper uh, be the art work for that, and so they did it with this, with the paperback and the hardcover, and they did it in Mexico. I was down in Mexico uh, three weeks ago. That's the first Spanish language edition on the left of On Paper de Papel, and on the right just published in Korea, and I've just been invited by the Ministry of Culture in Korea to uh, give a keynote address there in December, which is interesting so, for this book. So when you talk about a common bond, that, uh, that really ties cultures and people together. Paper, I, I'm really so gratified that uh, we already have a Chinese book in the works and a Japanese book in the works, so it's, it's reaching across cultural uh, uh, borders to, to really uh, resonate with a number of people. And so, but for this book, what I did, now this is okay. Now, I've given variations of this talk on a number of occasions, and I, for the most part, haven't given a title down there because it's usually a quiz. I say, can anyone tell me, please, what we're looking at? Well, I'm telling you right now. It's the Diamond Sutra, 868 AD. <clears throat> and what you're looking at in one image is two of the four outstanding inventions of antiquity which the cl Chinese claim for themselves. You're looking at print, and you're looking at paper. Now, when we think of print, we think of Johann Gutenberg in 1450 introducing printing with metal type. Well, really, the Chinese did this more than 500 years earlier, but not with metal, but on wood blocks. And as fabulous as that is, how many of you have had a chance to see the exhibition? Stuart has a, has a scroll in his collection that's 100 years older than this. You want to talk about how special this is, is this is unique. There's only one of its kind, it's in the British Library. What does make it unique is that it is the oldest known example of a printed book. So what Stuart has is a manuscript, but on paper that is 1,500 years old, and, look, and if you look at it, it's magnificent. So when you say paper is perishable, it doesn't last. Well, you have a, a sheet of paper in this exhibition that is 1,500 years old. Uh, so I started in 2007, I was uh, that NEH, uh, Grant was wonderful. It allowed me to go to, to, go to China. And uh, of the pictures that you'll see here, this is one that I have in there largely because it's a pretty picture. But uh, I shot most of the pictures that you'll see in here. But in 2007, with a group of uh, an international, a very small group of paper historians, believe it or not, I was the only civilian that went along. The others were professional historians of paper. I joined this group for a three-week journey to China, to Sichuan and uh, Yunnan provinces, to find where we could examples of paper being made today, still being made today in much the same way as it was when introduced there about 2,000 years ago. The Chinese will give you a date, 105 AD. They'll even give you a name, a man named Kai Lung. Uh, actually, we now know that paper probably evolved over 200 years prior to that. But what the Chinese had hit on, and it's a stroke of genius, and as I said, this book at one time was going to be called Common Bond. Uh, my editor, for a number of reasons, mainly she said, we live in a time, it's a cute title, she said, but we live in a time where we cannot afford to be cute. We have to tell people it's a book about paper, it's on paper. And I said, that's fine. They will call the first chapter Common Bond. I really like Common Bond. Uh, but what the Chinese had, had discovered was, this, was how to use this miracle of, of science and chemistry known as hydrogen bonding. What paper is, what really does make it a unique material. I mentioned papyrus. I anticipate the question, does paper emerge from papyrus? No, the two have nothing to do with one another. 
Papyrus is a lamination of strips made from a weed that used to grow once upon a time uh, abundantly along the banks of the Nile River. It's Egyptian. They would strip it, and there were certain properties in the plant that so you could laminate it at right angles, and you'd pound it together, and you made these scrolls, and that was papyrus. Paper emerges in China. And, what, and another distinguishing factor is you can make paper out of any vegetative source. And paper has, in fact, been made from crushed walnuts, from seaweed, from any imaginable vegetative source because there is this distinctive, unique character of cellulose that has what they call hydroxyl bonds. I won't get into it, but I'm sure there are some chemists in the room. But it is this, it is this ability of, of, of hydrogen and, and uh, oxygen atoms combining almost as if drawn together like a magnet when you reduce veget vegetation to a pulp. You pound it into a pulp, you immerse it in copious volumes of water, and the third element is to pass it through a screen, a mold. So what, it, what paper is, in essence, it's a layer of a, of a vegetative material passed through a flat, porous screen left to dry, and when, what you have when it dries is a sheet of what we call paper. It's a miracle. And the Chinese hit upon this. How they did, who knows? Uh, but what I really, one of the many things I loved about it is there was nothing inevitable about it. Papyrus, I think there was an, an, an inevitability to it. But paper really took some perception. It took some intelligence. It took some thinking. Well, we just, we just don't put vegetation together with water and make a sheet of paper. You have to pound it into a pulp. You have to really make these fragments small so that it will release the, the atoms which will, which will bond. And so really this trip that I made to China was along the old Burma Road. If you're all familiar with the Burma Road from the days of World War II, you've heard about it flying the hump from India into, uh, uh, into uh, the city of Kunming where we uh, uh, provisioned uh, Chiang Kai-shek's troops. Well, the old Burma Road is what you see at the bottom of that uh, bridge. The new Burma Road is the one above. For the most part, we drove on the new one. But that is a particular highway that travels 3,000 miles from uh, uh, Beijing to Mumbai and in India. And it's really transf transforming the whole part of the world. But you're looking at the foothills of the Himalayas. Yunnan province is really the, the, the number one area in China. It's well. And the, uh, the extreme southwestern part of China. It's 2,000 miles or so west of Beijing. And that's really where we went to find what we were looking for. And as you can see, many of the old ways still predominate. The gentleman you see in the lower left is a man named uh, Guan Kaiyun. He was our guide, a member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, Sciences, an internationally renowned botanist, speaks perfect English. And he wanted to see for himself examples of what I'm about to show you, where we could find people making paper in much the same way today as they did when it was introduced there. Now, this is a gentleman at a place called Jade Spring, near the border with Burma. His family had been making paper on this very site for 800 or so years, or so we were told. And, and, and it just so happened, coincidentally, the month after we were there, he was planning to close. Not so much because of lack of interest or lack of business, but his grandson was not interested in, in following in the papermaking craft. He was out working on that brand new highway, in fact, for good pay, building a highway. But so we were there. And one thing we noticed place after place, while well, he was the paper maker who posed for my photograph, his wife really does all the work. <laughs> and, uh, and there she is. We got samples of this paper everywhere we went, fabulous examples of paper. And look at this, is, this is how the fiber of choice is being brought to, this is another studio, whatever you want to call it, a mill. Those are paper mulberry tree branches. Now, this particular kind of paper, it's not, they are not using wood per se, they're using the inner bark of this sapling. Of the, so these are early, they, usually they harvest these branches, they don't cut down the whole tree, it's the, the younger saplings, they take the branches, they scoop out the, what it's called the bast. It looks kind of like you'll see some photographs of it shortly. And they wash it and they cook it. They pound it into a pulp. Nothing has changed here. We arrived at this particular mill, that very same mill where that woman was carrying the fiber. And Elaine Koretsky, this woman who has been traveling to the Far East for 40 or 50 years, kind of documenting, being in her own way, in fact, what many people say is the dard hunter of her generation. Dard hunter, the great Ohio native uh, from Chillicothe, uh, 
whose home I actually went to visit for this book, the great Dard Hunter who wrote The History and Technique of an Ancient Craft, published by my publisher, Alfred A. Knopp, which liberated me in a great extent because I didn't have to go and repeat the, 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 the great history because he had already done it beautifully. It can't be replicated. So it kind of freed me in a way to do the kinds of things I like to do as a cultural historian. But we arrived here. Elaine was shouting, they're cooking, they're cooking. She had been traveling for 40 years and she had never actually arrived in a day where they're actually cooking the fiber. They do it two or three days a month and there you see a lot of that best, it's being soaked. That's, it looks kind of like a pasta, doesn't it? And it's, uh, it's soaking, it's gonna make a very nice paper. And, there, and here is the, and I could show you these old images, 1500 years old, 2000, doesn't matter. It's the same process. You make, put this fiber in a big solution you, uh, uh, of fresh water. You have to have fresh water. You have to have a vegetative source, a screen mold, and then, you, and then you make a post of paper. And we saw this. We probably found over the three weeks that we were there 30 or 40 instances. Some of the paper was dried on brick walls in the sun. Others were uh, dried on metal plates. Everybody smokes cigarettes in China, by the way. Uh, these are paper makers taking a break. And again, as I said, every, I'm going through these quickly because there were a lot of them. And everywhere we went, they were, they were uh, uh, making paper. This is spirit paper. So a lot of the handmade paper that's made in China, there are 1.3 billion people. Many millions of people are still uh, good Buddhists, and paper is very useful. And it's a paper, they burn paper. These are offerings. This was a thousand year old, uh, pardon me, Buddhist temple outside of Kunming. We happened to get there. We, this is where they sell the, the spirit paper. That's where they burn it. And from uh, Yunnan, we went up to Sichuan province, the home of the panda bear, and uh, the great inland sea, the Shunan Bamboo Sea, uh, uh, all bamboo, th many, many square miles of bamboo. Now here you would say, well, how come it took us in the West until the 19th century to figure out how to get fiber out of a tree? Uh, useful fiber for paper making, which actually led to very bad paper, where they've been getting bamboo for using bamboo in China for hundreds of years prior to that. Well, the simple answer is bamboo is not a tree, it's a, it's a grass. And so it doesn't have the lignin in it, which causes so many of the problems in paper making. But so much of what we saw down in Sichuan, we saw replicated up here, only the fiber up here is bamboo. Same thing, making paper, smoking cigarettes. This is go this is a... <laughs> This is wonderful calligraphic paper called Xuanza. It's for the name of a, of a province in China. And this particular paper is exquisite paper used for calligraphy for art purposes. It's about eight feet long. And this, this really takes, takes a two-man team to make these sheets of handmade paper. And again, here we are drying on metal, metal plates. And uh, this was a place that reminded me of, of uh, James Hilton's uh, Lost Horizon, Shangri-La. We had to really climb up a, a, a mountain, really, to get to where they were making this paper. Why do we have to climb a mountain? Or in other instances, why do we have to go to the bottom of a ravine where I actually fell down and slid into the Yangtze River and my recorder was running? You know, that's one of the funniest things you ever want to hear. Uh, uh, <laughs> people yelling in Chinese and myself saying things that are not in Chinese, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I don't want to repeat in this particular <laughs> venue, but because that's where the clean, where the, the purer the water, the better, the better the paper that you make. And everywhere we went, paper was drying. And this woman, Xue Tao, uh, my editor at, at uh, Alfred Trump wanted to use this particular photo as the frontispiece. She is recognized as the first female paper maker in China. She was also a renowned poet of her time, ninth century. And what really is very interesting about her, she, this, these are in the years, but there was no bleach. So if paper, if the vegetative source was pink or red or whatever it was, uh, that would kind of come out in the paper. So if you notice on her gown, and this is really in Chengdu, the capital of uh, uh, Sichuan province, and this is the grotto where she made her paper. That's a spring on the left. And she's surrounded by 150 different species of bamboo she used in her paper making. But she also used the hibiscus for what we call a formation aid. A formation aid will, will speed up the flow of the paper through the screen to give you a thinner sheet of paper, or it can slow it down to give you a thicker sheet of paper. 
and her particular formation aid of choice was the hibiscus and examples of her paper which survive after all these years still to have kind of a pink tinge. And whenever you see her represented in an illustration, it's always red. You can always see the, uh, the hibiscus. And so my editor said, that's the picture for your frontispiece. And I said, well, I like it too. And so now from here, the next year, I went to Japan. Wonderful. Thank you, National Endowment for the Humanities. But this is Echizen City, which is about four hours northwest of Tokyo. And really, there are maybe 50 or 60 handmade paper, hand paper makers still in Japan. Oh, about 100 years ago, there were 67. There was a census. There were over 65,000 of them. And actually, at the outbreak of World War II, there were still maybe 15,000 of them. So it's a vanishing skill to make quality paper by hand. So I wanted to go to this city. And the Japanese also, it's one of these many instances where the Japanese took a skill or a skill that was taught to them, or they learned, and they really improved it, and they excelled, and where paper actually became a part of their culture, of their faith, of their spirituality. And, and in Echizen City is this particular Shinto shrine. It's, a, it's, the, uh, it's, it's dedicated to Kawakama Gozen. She is the goddess of paper making. And this, it is said that she introduced, she taught the local people in this village. Really, they, this is a, is a is a, a region noted for its rice growing, but for the purity of its water. They're in these mountains. This mountain, uh, this uh, snow melts. You get magnificent water and good fiber. And so really it is believed that paper making begins in Japan here. It's also facing the Korean Peninsula, which is really how paper gets from China to Korea and to Japan. And this is uh, arguably where it was introduced. I really wanted to go and pay my respects to the goddess of paper making. And she's really only a local deity. So she's really not revered throughout Japan, but she is a, is a deity there. And uh, once a year, for three days, they go up the mountain that you see behind, behind you there. There's an effigy. They carry her down, and they carry her about the village. And they all uh, ask her to give them blessings. And everywhere you go, you see this handmade paper. The little sign on the lower right, that's the, the uh, litter that they carry her effigy down on. It tells the story of Kawakama. Goes. So really, I wanted to go there. But really, I wanted to go spend a day with this gentleman, Ichibe Iwano IX, son of Ichibe Iwano VIII. He is a living <laughs> national treasure paper maker. The eighth was the first living national treasure paper maker in Japan. And he, this is the only instance of where the son has followed the father. And there are only five of them. And of course, they are living national treasures because it is hoped, it is expected that they will pass on their skills to the next generation. And so his son has agreed to work with them. And that's his son you see in the lower frame. And when I arrived, his hands were beet red. They were on their hands and knees. They were in the water room here. And they were going through this washi, they call it, this uh, 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 mulberry. They were making washi, which is the name for Japanese paper. And this is kozo. It's, a, it's their name for mulberry bast. And they were taking out by hand their fingers, little specks of bark, so the paper would have a special purity to it. His paper is regarded as the world standard by many artists. And there he is. His wife's doing all the work. Same thing. <laughs> I didn't see him make a single sheet of paper while I was there. <laughs> But it's still his, it's theirs. They've been doing this side by side for 50 years. There she is again. And then he finally, went, if there are any conservators in the room, you know that Japanese paper is the paper of choice when you're doing preservation. It's thin and it's exceedingly strong. It's very thin, it's almost gossamer thin. And he, well, he took a sheet of paper and he told me through the interpreter to tear it. I didn't do it, I couldn't do it. I couldn't commit such a desecration. So he took it and he tore it. It was so strong. But look at that one fiber. You can see in the lower right that one fiber of that. Of that, uh, You look at a piece of paper today that's made you know, from, you, you don't see anything like that. So that's one of the reasons you get the special strength. Before I left, he took a little piece of his paper and he gave me this little mark and he said, and he wrote on it, the joy of living with paper. So this, I didn't really mean to travel all the way around the world where paper is made, but it did seem essential for me to go to China, go to Japan, and to really give some sense of the 1800 year migration. And that's really what I, I did for uh, China. I did go to, well, we had to, somebody had to go to Amalfi, of course, in Italy, because they, that's one of the very first footholds in Europe. Okay, so that was an exception. 
But uh, uh, as paper travels about the globe, the story of its migration, you talk about the cultural applications. Now, Stuart has an Islamic, I, I, I guess I'll anticipate this question. What's the most surprising item in the 50 that are here? And I have to say the one I was surprised the most to see, not that he owns it, but that I didn't know he owned it, and it really is so out of character with the other elements in the, in the exhibition, which is, which is a sheet of, of uh, uh, Arabic paper with uh, Quranic writings on it. And the, the Arabs, actually, the story goes, in 721 AD, the Japanese, uh, the Chinese army, which is, uh, got involved in a border dispute with the uh, Arab Caliphate uh, in Central uh, Europe, Central Asia, at Samarkand. The only time they ever fought in the war, the, uh, the Arabs were, were victorious. This is do fully documented. And as a consequence of their victory, they took prisoners who knew paper making. In exchange for their lives, it is said, they taught the Arabs how to make paper. And for the next 500 years or so, this part of the world really becomes the center of paper making. And it really isn't in, for another 500 years or so, and we'll see it presently in the next few slides, that the skills are introduced to the West. They really didn't do a very good job of recording how they did it. Stuart's manuscript is Kashmiri. This is Kashmiri. It's kind of late. This is 18th century, 19th century, same as his. And it's one of the very few examples of where they really describe and show to you how they made their paper. And what you're looking at is almost precisely the same thing that we saw in China and Japan, and as you'll see in Europe. But before we do that, these are some examples of Islamic paper making. It was largely used for Quranic uh, purposes to, to spread the, 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 the Quran. The paper is introduced about 100 years after Muhammad. But they also used a paper, this is a flower, a period of great flowering in that part of the world. But they didn't really take to printing. Calligraphy becomes the most revered form of art. Uh, and if you look at the calligraphy on Stuart's uh, manuscript downstairs, it's dazzling. It's absolutely, it makes you weak in the knees at how gorgeous and how beautiful it is. And so they celebrated writing even more than artistic work. And these are, again, Quranic manuscripts from Persia, from Iran, from Turkey and uh, from various centuries. Now I have this one here, it's from North Africa. It's from the uh, uh, late 11th century. I, I picked this one because it's from North Africa where paper making at about that time enters Europe for the first time in Spain. Spain, which was controlled by, by the Muslims for many hundreds of years, so it makes sense that the, the techniques would enter Spain first. From there it goes to Italy and for, to France, and from France it goes up to Germany, elsewhere, and so really, as I said, Dard Hunter gives you this wonderful history. I don't have to give it to you in great detail, and I don't have to do it here. But one thing I did want to do is to show you how it's been illustrated in books and illustrations. This is, you must have a Nuremberg Chronicle. Absolutely, yeah. I'd be shocked if you didn't. But well, this is the last great history of the world printed before it was known that Columbus had arrived in America. So what he shows, and that's, that's a picture of Nuremberg, in the lower right-hand corner in the inset there is the first paper mill in Germany, north of the Alps, established by a man named Ullmann Stromer, 1390. It was very successful, and you find it just a little bit more than coincidental that 60 years later, Gutenberg is working on a way to print on paper. Would he ever have done that if he had to print on parchment or vellum? Of course not. It would have taken 260 sheep to make one Bible. For, for vellum. So obviously you had to have a, a source of paper. It had to be available and abundant and, and affordable, and paper did that. Moving very quickly, again, now we see paper, make, paper making in Germany. Jos Daman, 1568. Zonka, that's the first illustration of, of, of the, the, this, these are called beaters. Paper now is being, and what the Arabs introduced, by the way, in which, in which the Europeans adopted, and actually when it came to North America, was the use of rags, cotton rags. To, that became the principal source of fiber. Even though you could make paper from any vegetative fiber, the best paper has always been and continues to be rag paper, paper made from cotton. Cotton is 100% cellulose. It makes for the best paper. So rag paper was introduced in the Middle East. And what you see, those, those uh, stampers on the right, they're stamping. They're pounding those rags into a pulp to be made into paper. And these are other illustrations. Uh, Diderot in his encyclopedia, I'll move pretty quickly through them. 
Ah, I put these in for my trip to Mexico a couple of weeks ago, because we here in North America, our part of North America, British North America, you know, we pride ourselves. I guess we get a little, uh, a little smug about the fact that, oh, the Bay Psalm book, 1640, first book printed in British North America, and uh, the Rittenhouse paper mill, 13, uh, 1690, the first paper mill. Well, guess what? They beat us to it by well over 100 years in South America. When I went down there, I decided, well, I put in six books out of maybe three or 400 that were printed in Mexico by the Spanish beginning 100 years prior to the, to the, pub the uh, publication of the Bay Psalm book. And the one you see on the right, that, and this is two colors. This is two color printing uh, it's with an illustration. It's pretty amazing, and it, it's unique. And that one example, and, when I, and unbeknownst to me and to them, they didn't know the images that I had, but when I was at the National Library of Mexico, they brought out this particular book. And I, I have to say, holding that was a great, great experience. And I'm holding a book that's older. Than, but here, these are a couple of the other. Just see the dates. And they're beautifully done. They're all religious tracts. It goes up to 1627. Now, this is a pretty interesting set of books. These are Dard Hunter's own copies of a very famous book by Jacob Christian Schaefer published between 1765 and 1771. He was a German naturalist, a scientist. And th the world was now desperate to find new fibers to make paper because the rag supply wasn't sufficient. And what makes these books very special is he, he experimented with over 80 different plants. He made paper by himself and he tipped these, these, these uh, examples into the seven volumes. It's one of the rarest books. Uh, I think only seven copies are in American institutions complete. And that's Dard Hunter's copy, which I examined. I ha handled another one at Harvard. And we come to this, these two little disparate uh, uh, circulars. Americans, encourage your own manufactories. Ladies, save your rags. This is 1801. The Crane, Zenas Crane, is opening the Crane Paper Mill in Western Massachusetts. He signs it in Worcester, where kind of I, I live. But it's 1801. And at the same time, in 1801, 1802, on the other side of the ocean, there's a man named Matthias Koops. And if you read the fine print, this is the first book printed on paper made entirely from straw. They were trying to find uh, uh, new forms of fiber. Now, I handle this book. It is yellow. Uh, I, the Houghton Library copy at Harvard University. And what was really amazing about it is that after 200 years, I opened it up and it still had this ex extraordinary smell of fresh cut grass. It was pretty remarkable. And, and it has that, that same color. But rag pickers, we talk, we've talk. we all heard about rag pickers. Here's Harper's Weekly, uh, 1879, same sort of thing. Uh, I went across the Hudson River to the Markel Mill. Uh, this, this is all fiber coming from the concrete canyons of Manhattan, 100% recycled paper. They make their one million See, I do write about everything. One million rolls of toilet paper a day uh, at Markel. Uh, uh, and that's in a chapter I call One and Done, by the way, which is... Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you say, well, that's pretty interesting. But, you know, think, think. If, if you were to be asked what is totally indispensable to you and what would you have a panic attack if you told you were, there, there was going to be a shortage, as Johnny Carson did once in 1973, he said, hey, do you know what? There's a, there's a toilet paper shortage. He was wrong. But there was a run on toilet paper for the next six weeks. It was reported on the front page of the New York Times. And one of the most amazing things about paper, the British Association of Paper Historians estimate there are 20,000 different commercial uses of paper in the world today. Paperless society, give me a break. I wrote an op-ed for the LA Times, the myth of the paperless society. You know, can you imagine? Uh, in fact, there was a great, a great, a notable uh, historian of libraries. He said the paperless so society is about as probable as the paperless bathroom. And we'll, <laughs> we'll leave that one there. Jesse Sherrill. But here is where they, this is, we wonder where all your recycled papers from the blue, from the blue barrels go. That's where they go. Then I went to the Glatfelter mill and so I went to four mills for this, for this particular book. And Glatfelter has a mill in Chillicothe, uh, Ohio. And so they produce, by their own estimate, one thought paper for 1,000 different products. I really wanted to go to a mill where the trees came in on one end and paper came out the other, and that's the Glatfelter Mill. This is, a, this is a company which 10 years ago, their annual sales were $500 million a year. Not bad, you know, but when you think international paper is $26 billion, there's a big difference. 
But in seven or eight years, they're up to two billion. And what they have done is they've diversified. They say, okay, everybody else is making paper for books or for this and that. They have diversified. So they make 75% of the paper for this old machine, which dates to 1879, the day we were there, was making paper for postage stamps. They make 85% of the paper for tea bags. They make paper for Carlsberg beer labels. They, they have a thousand different products. It's basically the same product. They'll do a, a formulation. They might make it thicker or thinner, but they diversify. And here are the, some of the rolls of paper spinning out. I like these. Uh, because the pastel colors, these were going off to the Hallmark greeting card company. They do most of the paper for Hallmark cards. So those pastel rolls, the lower right, by the way, that was at the Crane paper mill where they make all the paper for United States currency. I needed clearance from the Secret Service to go in and see this. And what you're looking at spinning, I really couldn't stop it. It was moving along at 60 miles an hour. Those are all Benjamin Franklins for $100 bills, as you can see, spinning by it was pretty, pretty, all right, now this is a quiz, but you have, because we're running out of time, you have to tell me quickly what you think it is. Okay, nobody knows, nobody gets it. No, what they are, you all heard of the Stamp Act of 1765. I argue that the American Revolution gets its start, <clears throat> and I think historians will agree, from the uh, passage of the Stamp Act in 1765, as a way for the uh, Brits to pay for the recently concluded French and Indian War. They even said it, we need to raise. They won that war, but they doubled their territory. Now they needed a garrison to, uh, to uh, defend the, the territories. So they announced a Stamp Act. And the, this is a selection of very scarce stamps from embossed paper, not adhesive stamps, but it was literally stamped. And what the Stamp Act was, was a tax on the many, many ways that the colonists had come to rely on paper in their daily lives. Every clause in the Stamp Act, there were more than 50 of them, was a tax on a, a property purchase, a death certificate, a marriage certificate. If you wanted to be a lawyer, boy, they really took it out on the lawyers. It was 12 pounds. You know, that's a lot of money, 10 pounds, excuse me, to get, a, uh, to get your, law, your law degree. So that never, it never went into effect, but uh, there's a very wonderful... Uh, book collector uh, by the name of uh, Jeremy Belknap, who founded the, Amer the Massachusetts Historical Society. And he saved these, and I saw these at the Mass Historical. And then, of course, they, the, the, everyone agrees that the fatal flaw of the Stamp Act was that they also put a stamp on newspapers. Big mistake. Never, never tax the guys who own the bottle of ink. And this is, if you'll see, this is uh, October 31st, 1865. The Stamp Act is supposed to go in, this is Halloween as it happens, the next day the Stamp Act is supposed to go into effect. It's a tombstone, he says, expiring. None of them uh, would, pay, would pay the fa the, uh, the, the freight. The Stamp Act was uh, discontinued, but the, for the next 10 years you have the run up to the American Revolution. Well, I have a chapter that I call face value. I really wanted to test the cliche that some things are not worth the paper they're printed on. And, and what better way to do that is to go on eBay at the time and buy some uh, Zimbabwean currency. And I think I paid 50 cents, and I overpaid, for this $100 trillion banknote. <laughs> so really, what does this tell you about paper? That really, this is, I guess this is the thrust of what I'm trying to do, that paper is the only manufactured product that I can think of that gets value strictly, solely, and only by the intellectual construct, by what we print on it. You know, this is not worth $100 trillion because it has no value, but the American dollar is because we, it's a surrogate for value. So, all right, this is not the only example, by the way, so needless to say, this is the Weimar Republic. They're using, they're using uh, their rice marks for a wallpaper, a woman's cooking with it. They're making some wonderful constructions out of it. Uh, but now we're moving up the ladder, so I start from total value, valuelessness. We're talking... Uh, uh, with one group today at lunch about ephemera. These are objects that were not meant to last the long run, but, but the, they did. These are chromolithographs. This is the John and Carolyn Grossman collection at the Winter Third Museum. They collected 250,000 pieces of chromolithograph uh, illustration over a 100-year period, about 50 items a day over a 30-year period, and it's the largest single acquisition the Winter Third Museum has ever paid, and it's for paper, and they have wonderful... Uh, Wonderful things there, but again, it's ephemera. Things were not meant to last a long time, but when they do, you all of a sudden have a window into life. 
All right, this is cigarettes. That's a whole other story. Cigarettes and, you know, everything's not bright and uh, wonderful. I mean, I write about uh, cartridge paper, how the introduction of the paper cartridge in the 17th century, I mean, trust me on this, read the chapter, fiery consequences, changed the whole nature of armed combat. For centuries up until this time, you had to load your weapon with, you put in your projectile, you tamped, you put in your gunpowder, you tamped it down. It might take you a minute to do this. It took you 46 separate steps. The introduction of the paper cartridge reduced that to 26. A skilled, a skilled soldier could do this and, and do this three times a minute. And, this, and, and the paper cartridge led directly to the introduction of the cigarette. You have to read how that happened. I don't have time to do it. But those two images that you saw are from the collections of the New York Public Library, the Arendt's collection, where they have 250,000 examples of uh, a collection on tobacco. This is the $2 million ephemera club. Actually, Action Comics, a, a copy just went for $3.1 million. That's the Nicholas Cage copy on the right, by the way. He reported it stolen about, about 10 or so years ago. The insurance company paid him $150,000. They found it and it went up for auction and it went for $2.1 one million dollars. So that's 21 million times, 21 million times its original newsstand price in 1936. And it's ratty, rotten paper. It's acidic paper. It's worthless. I mean, as a piece of paper. Take a look at the Honus Wagner baseball card. That's the Wayne Gretzky card. The last time that sold was 2.5 million. That's the Trey Skelling stamp. They won't, they won't say how much that sold for, but it was around five million. It's one of a kind. The reason it's so rare is because it was supposed to be green, not yellow, and it's very rare, but uh, Bob Dylan, a uh, Rolling Stone, that just two months ago, four pieces of, of hotel stationery, $2.4 million. So we're co kind of going up the scale, and it's not just pictures, and it's not just manuscripts. It's stamps, it's currency, paper. Here's the champ right here, the British Guiana one cent magenta just a, a month or so ago. It's probably the most money ever spent for the lightest weighted object. That's the size of it right there, and it went for just under $10 million. Here's the Bay Sam book. We were to, I actually handled this copy. I actually thought Stuart might get this, but he, I think, wisely decided to back off. There were other things <laughs> that, that, that he was thinking about. I'm giving him a little rib here, but. Uh, you know, that's that is. But he said, well, you know, you got these Mexican books that come earlier, and you're right. And I just showed you some of them. And it's actually not in the best of condition. That was one of two that the Boston Public Library had, $15 million. But, you know, what's the all-time record for one piece of paper? Raphael, $47.94 million, and it was a, it was a sketch in anticipation of, the, of, a, of, a, of a Sistine Chapel painting, a piece of paper for $48 million. But this is priceless at the Massachusetts Historical Society, 14 million documents. On the lower right, it's signed by uh, William Bradford. It's a letter written in 1638 to his counterpart uh, up in Boston, John Winthrop. What makes it remarkable and why the librarian thought it was really important for me to see it is because the answer that, uh, that Winthrop drafted to Bradford was written on the same piece of paper. This is how scarce paper was and how valuable it was, and not an inch was to be, sp and it was a letter of some great consequence. I write about it in the book. A uh, man by the name of Ken Rendell has a fabulous World War II museum outside of Boston, and he's a bookseller. He's actually the guy who built Bill Gates's book collection, and he also collects a remarkable, uh, has a remarkable museum of World War II artifacts, many of which are paper and which are kept in that uh, safe that you see there. So I was there, we went over, he opened up, he took out this document, he put it in my hands. And if you'll notice the dark handwriting, and the, dark, the darker ink, that's Adolf Hitler. On the left is Neville Chamberlain. That's the draft of the Munich Agreement. And he said, what you're holding in your hands is the document that starts World War II. You talk about the power of a piece of paper, you know, to have a, a certain kind of resonance for it. That did it for me as much as anything. Uh, well, we saw, if you saw your exhibition, you saw this wonderful Shakespeare folio. That's a first at the Folger Library. That's the Declaration of Independence. That's our birth certificate as a nation. The minute, the second we become a nation is documented on a piece of paper, not parchment. You go to the National Archives, the one that is signed on parchment, that was done over a period of weeks. The Declaration of Independence was printed on paper through that hut summer night, sent out on horseback throughout the new nation, 
to declare our independence. So you talk about virtual reality, world wonders that exist no more only on paper. Jacques Carré was a French draftsman. He was sent to the Acropolis seven years before the Venetians bombarded it and reduced so much of what you see to rubble. You have these, but you have these illustrations that survive. And then Lord Elgin came in and took what was left. So what you have today is just a shell of what was visualized and recorded on paper by Carré. And you can say the same thing of St. Paul's Cathedral, which was reduced to rubble in the Great Fire of London. A man named William Dugdale was urged to go out prior to that, 1658, just eight years prior to that. And he, he, they, they, he read all of the histories, all of the, all of the, uh, uh, the documents in St. Paul's Cathedral, and he, and he retained the services of Wenceslas Haller, who did these remarkable drawings. And the only way you can see old St. Paul's Cathedral is to go to that book. That's a book you've got to get, Stuart, I think. Coming forward, however, now paper, there's a paper revolution that is sweeping through Europe and, and things are happening. Architecture is really blooming. It's becoming a science. They're using instruments. This is Christopher Wren. This is the new St. Paul's Cathedral. These are his drawings. People are drawing to scale. Uh, you're actually able to build, a, why did it take 150 years to build a cathedral? They didn't have any plans. They figured it out on site. These are again uh, uh, drawings from Wren. And there's, a, there's the finished product from the uh, 1800s. And these are some of the instruments that were developed specifically for architecture to take from the mind's eye, pass it through the hand onto a piece of paper. And drawings, would the Industrial Revolution have been possible without blueprints? Could somebody have made a locomotive? You make a wheel over here, you make tracks over there, you make the boiler over here. It all has to come together and fit perfectly. It becomes possible through these blueprints. I grew up in the city of Lowell, Massachusetts, the world's first planned industrial uh, city back in the 1820s. And all of these documents on what beautiful Watman paper are still there 200 years after the fact, the original drawings for that city. What can you say about Leonardo da Vinci? Uh, I, I have a chapter where I actually argue that paper becomes not only a tool of the creative process, but an element, an essential element of the creative process. Leonardo, I think we have 16 to maybe 20 of his paintings that survive. None of his architectural uh, uh, designs are survived or built. None of his sculptures survived, but what we have are thousands of these drawings. And uh, I do a wonderful interview with Martin Kemp, who's handled all of these drawings. When you think about it, what we get from Leonardo is what we get on paper. And just, I mean, you can just look at these things and I don't even have to comment on them. They're remarkable. And Beethoven is the same. He never went anywhere without paper. All of his stuff was, what he didn't use, he used in other places. 3,500 uh, surviving manuscripts, Thomas Edison. I handled uh, his notebooks, 3,500 of them. That's his drawing on the left for the light bulb, which uses a filament of carbonized paper for the first light bulb. And the first phonograph uses, uses wax paper, paraffin, for the first surface for a recording. But everything was done on paper. Of course, I have a whole chapter on the bureaucracy, 80 billion pieces of paper. I took that picture of the, the, Washington, uh, the Washington subway. That's real red tape, by the way. We, we call it red tape for a reason. But I was there. They were doing some conservation. And uh, they were throwing those away. And I said, well, I, you know, I'm a collector. I said, geez, can I have some of those? They gave me four pieces of red tape. You know, it's just a, my, and the, these, of course, are bays at the uh, Library of Congress. This is the original Monopoly game. Uh, this is the National Archives. Uh, uh, they had these things out for conservation. The, you know the most, the most requested archive at the National Archives, number one, is Roswell, New Mexico. More so than the Kennedy assassination, more so than Watergate, and uh, the Kennedy, those are the top two, but Roswell, New Mexico, for some reason, that's the draw. There's an old radio antenna in there, no flying saucers, unfortunately. And again, this is the Harvard Weitzman <laughs> Center, what's a piece of paper worth? You know, the value goes beyond money. It's, 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 it's a cultural worth, it's personal worth. Uh, I'm just going very quickly here. I do have a wonderful chapter on origami. That's uh, Robert Lang, who gave up a career, two PhDs, a laser physicist, uh, but he became a, an origami master. He uses uh, log uh, algorithms to, to actually design folds. Now, origami, you know, is one sheet of paper. You can't use glue, you can't use scissors. It's all folding. And that's Michael LaFosse on the right, who actually makes his own paper. 
and you see it's black on one side and white on the other, and that's his famous penguin. He said, the first time I did it, the belly was black and the, the body was white, and he had to take it apart and reverse all the faults. But that's kind of fun. You say fault. paper can be fun in games, but you know, I think this is one exercise that children, you know, they're taught in Montessori, they're taught in kindergarten how to fold paper, but you go all the way up to astrophysicist Eric Demain, a MacArthur fellow at MIT, does these extraordinary uh, uh, origami sculptures that are in the Modern Museum of Art, and you use it to actually solve uh, uh, mathematical problems. Well, I put this in for my good friends in Ohio. You know, it's a form of origami. It's the Cleveland Airport, and I was going through there a while back, and I said, paper plane, got to take a picture of it. And of course, this is the birthplace of aviation. And you say, well, all right, the first plane isn't paper. Well, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you say that. These are lanterns, paper lanterns. I shot these pictures of Martha's Vineyard. They're pretty. But they also suggest the first flight by human beings aboard a paper balloon in France made by the Montgolfier brothers with three layers of paper made in the family mill with, in a, with an outer sack. And of course, that's the first instance of flying, which is paper. And of course, we all know what happened in Florida in the, uh, in the election of 2000. You know, but uh, we laugh about it. But they replaced those paper ballots with all electronic ones. And boy, did that, was that a big mistake? Because guess what? If there's no paper trail, and I, I think we've said this in Ohio too, if I may, you know, I think you've had a similar sort of dynamic uh, discussed here. Uh, so really what we have now are, you have optical scanning devices, but you still have a paper trail. So again, in, 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 the, in the furtherance of your democracy, how does paper fit in, the paper ballot? Argo, the movie, you remember Argo? Tony Mendez, Ben Affleck. I interviewed him three years before Ben Affleck knew his name. That's the real Tony Mendez. That's his, that's his uh, uh, flaps and seals kit. He's showing me how to split a dollar bill. Everything about that deal, about how they got those people out of Iran, was all about paper. Everything, and they really didn't get into it so much in, in the uh, movie, but it was all about paper. And we really, I, I have a chapter on paper, we, our identities. We make our identities by paper, and uh, how paper is used in the intelligence community. I got into the NSA, the CIA, it was great, and Tony was wonderful. So, you know, this is, you won't see many of these anymore, uh, ticker tape parades, because there's no more ticker tape. But that's 1962, John Glenn. You know, now they have to go out to Connecticut and buy confetti when they want to do a ticker tape parade because there's no more ticker tape. But this is joyous. Paper is falling from the sky, and it kind of brings us to the final sequence that I have in my final chapter. And really, if there was an image that drove this book that got me going on it, wanted to do it, it's that image, as I said to the group this afternoon, it was that, it was that site on uh, September 11th, 2001, of all this paper just gushing out of these buildings. And the only artifacts of any consequence to survive in any fashion is paper. Paper was hip deep. Paper had, had flown all over the five boroughs. And I wondered as I was starting this book, is anyone archiving this stuff? What can you tell us about this first year of the 21st century, uh, about the paper that, that, that was really gushed out of this building? Are people saving? Well, it turns out that they were. and I. Uh, went to the new, what was being formed at the new 9-11 Museum. These are just various images that were taken that day. Look at that one, Larry Tow. That's a book over there at the landfill. So you say, was all the paper just mundane? Was it stock transfers, pleadings, just the regular stuff? Were there things that tell us um, uh, matters about ourselves, our history that, that did survive? Well, here's a business card that floated across the uh, East River and came to rest on a windowsill in Brooklyn that night. And it's a business card of a man named Pablo Ortiz who worked for the Port Authority. He's one of the great unknown heroes of the day. Uh, 911 telephone calls and people who survived. They, talk, they spoke about a man named Pablo Ortiz and another man who could have survived but who took tools and they, they were helping people escape. They had tools, they were get, helping them get out of, get out of, this is in the South Tower, uh, get out of trapped rooms, and then he perished that night, and that night his calling card, his business card, came to rest in a, in a, uh, uh, on a windowsill in Brooklyn, and I thought that was really, really pretty touching. But even more touching is this one, the final image, and when I went down and they were uh, making plans to open the new museum, this goes back to 2009, and the woman who was the archivist, she says, well, look, this we just got this a week or so ago. 
and she slid it across the table, and you're looking at a piece of sheet of common bond paper, common bond paper, plain copying paper. It's not signed, and what it says was 84th floor, West Office, 12 people trapped. It's totally authentic. The story is a woman was escaping the scene. This piece of paper fell. She picked it up. She ran. There was a guard outside the Federal Reserve Bank. She handed it to him. He looked at it, looked up, and the South Tower collapsed. It's not signed. So we thought that, well, if we never know who wrote this note, it speaks for everyone who perished that day, everybody who lost someone that day. But notice on the left there, there's a smudge. <clears throat> and I said to Jan Ramirez, who was the, the woman handling this, I said, what is that? And she said, well, that's blood. And of course, there was silence. And I said, well, is there a possibility? She said, yes, there is. The medical examiner hopes to get to it. We still have many thousands of fragments, as they say euphemistically that we have to go through. That was 2009. So as I was finishing this book two years ago, <clears throat> making my rounds, making my calls, bringing things up to date, and I called down there and I said, hey, did anything ever come of that 84th floor document? She was quiet. She said, actually, we got a hit. We have an identification. And the woman does not wish to talk about it because she had assumed that her husband had died instantly. The 84th floor was kind of the epicenter over that United Airlines flight, and I understood that, and I said, that's fine. But then a few days later, she called, and they said, well, Denise Scott will talk to you. And so I went down to Stamford, Connecticut, and trust me, in 50 years in this business, and I did my first professional interview in 1964 as a cub reporter. Easily the hardest, toughest interview I've ever had with anybody. She had three daughters. They had lived with the, under the, there's no closure here. That's a word I don't like. What kind of closure do you get that where you thought that your husband and the father of your daughters died instantly and now you know he was fighting desperately not only to save himself but his colleagues? So, but at least she, and one of the girls said, Daddy must have been so scared. She said, your daddy wasn't scared. He was fighting for himself and his friends and he died heroically. And I find it very, very interesting that she has retained possession of this. She's allowed the new museum to keep it as long as they want. And you talk about a piece of paper. What is the value in a piece of paper? She said that is the legacy of my husband to my daughters, and that's theirs. And that's, that's uh, the end of our presentation, and then we come back to the beginning. Thank you very much, I, I spoke too long. <laughs> No questions? Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> Break the ice. <clears throat> um, so I have a question oh, over here. Okay, over here. Thanks. So I'm sure this is probably a question you get, and that is the future of paper. So do you want to tell us a little bit about what you think if you were giving this talk in about 25 or 50 years, what would you be talking about the, in terms of something that would be new? I try example? not to make predictions, especially when it comes to books. Now, you ask about the future of paper. As I said, there are 20,000 identifiable commercial uses for paper, of which books and documents are maybe 5%. There are so many other uses for it. I don't see paper disappearing anytime soon. What's going to happen to the book? Who knows? I mean, uh, 100 years from now? I can't say. But I do believe that it's, it's a little premature to count the printed book out. You know, papyrus and paper survived simultaneously for a thousand years, parchment at the same time. I just don't think that the arrival of one medium necessarily uh, uh, obviates the other one. Or, or, I, I, I wish I could answer the question with more uh, confidence, but I can't. A hundred years is a long time. Twenty years is a long time to look into the future. I, but I do think there's a life for paper, whether or not it's, it is as a medium of textual transmission remains to be seen. But think of the third world too, you know. I mean, we have computers. They don't have they don't have all of these wonderful things all over the world. And the and the computer, the digital book is the first instance in the history of writing where you need an interface, you need a software, you need a device to be able to read. Before you just needed the ability to read, you know. I'm kind of skeptical of a, of a medium, uh, an archival medium in particular 
that you say, well, are we going to know 100 years from now how to get access this software? Do you have confidence in that? I know the National Archives. I interviewed the National Archivist. And whenever there's a very important archive that is born digital, you know what? They make a paper copy. The archival copy becomes the paper copy becomes the archival copy. So you tell me whether or not it has a life. I do think that it's just the same thing as the, the voting machine. Okay, they went, they got rid of the paper ballot. Well, you know what? That was flawed. So now they do, they do have a paper trail. <laughs> um, I have a question about paper and vellum. The, uh, the St. John's Bible that they're putting together in Minneapolis, they're doing it on vellum. Um, it's all hand done calligraphy, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to have a facsimile copy here. And they chose vellum, I think, to try to be true to the idea that that was what the, um, the, the medieval scribes and the scriptoria were working mm -hmm. on. But not always. And I'm wondering if you. It's if what a waste, I'm sorry. If you were going to pick, would you pick vellum or would you pick paper no, to I'd do the St. John's Bible? I'd, I'd pick paper. I mean, it was the natural, it was the natural progression. It's, you don't have to kill a lot of animals for it. Uh, it's, it's inexpensive. It's abundant. Uh, if you do it properly, you don't have to despoil the environment. You know, I mean, you can really have uh, uh, environmentally conscious ways of, re of, uh, of growing your fiber. So, of course, paper. I, I, I'm really, I, I'm opposed to the use of vellum and parchment today. Uh, I don't think you should use mammals to make, you know, what you can make paper with. I mean, it's, but that's an easy one <laughs> for me. Anyone else? I have a question about the migration from using wood pulp to some other, uh, maybe more <coughs> available vegetable matter. As we use so much paper, and we're cutting down trees, of course, people always say, oh, we're cutting, this is a whole tree, I'm just giving you a, 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 a report. Is there any evidence that we will be migrating to some other material? You mean a, a cellulosic material? Is, a, a cellulose material. Because it has to be cellulose. You yes, know, but it paper. isn't a tree. Well, they're growing eucalyptus trees, which grow like crazy, you know, mm. and, they, and mm. so uh -huh. they're, they're uh, especially down in South America, these huge... Uh, uh, eucalyptus plantations that they go. They're, they're, they are experimenting with very rapid growing papers, uh, uh, fiber sources that you can use. I mean, you know, it's really, again, it's like, it's like killing a, 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 a calf or a, a sheep to make a, a, a vellum, some vellum or parchment. It really bothers me and offends me that you would kill a, an old growth tree, you know, that's been around for two or three hundred years to make some toilet paper. That bothers me too. You know, I would hope that we can use more recycling and that we can use these, these, uh, uh, these, these uh, good sources of fiber to make paper. And I think that people are making strides with that. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I think the eucalyptus tree is pretty good. Seaweed, what's wrong with seaweed? You could use that too. I don't know. Hi. Hi. Uh, <coughs> first of all, I learned more, to, more about paper today than I ever thought I would. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so my question is, so this, the, the theme this year is perspectives on peace for the speaker series. And you're the first speaker. So how does this work in, right? <laughs> yeah, my question Good is, question. With, the, with this age of digital, <coughs> digitalization of, of thought, what role do you think paper has to play in creating peace in the future? You know, paper, the printing press, there was a wonderful book, Elizabeth Eisenstein, the printing press is an agent of change. You know, the printing press, I mean, and paper became this medium of transmission, and people are actually able to communicate. And I think paper, in its own way, serves that function. It's this medium of transmission. Uh, I don't know how, I mean, we use paper for everything. I mean, we, we record our history, we write our literature on it. Uh, it's just, and I suppose you could make, I showed you the, the Munich Agreement. Well, that's a bad uh, consequence of paper, isn't it? I mean, but I'd like to think that the good ones outweigh the, the bad. Paper doesn't make distinctions from between good and evil. I think it's merely an enabler, which is why people really never pay any attention to it. And as I started to go into it, and I said, wow, what a story. I mean, come on, this is there, and we just take it for granted. There are 20,000 uses for it. I hope the, the furtherance of peace would be one of them. But, but to be any more specific than that, I don't think I can do it. One more question. Do you still write letters? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the short answer to that is I don't think I ever did. <laughs> I was terrible. I was in Vietnam. My mother said, you never write, you know, and I wish I did. But uh, she wrote. That was good. It was nice to hear from her and others. <laughs> All right. Well, we have, um, okay. 
We have a gift ah. for you to thank you for coming to the University of oh, Dayton, to help us right. opening our speaker series oh, and our, wow. our uh, Should I open it now? Or no, take it with you. Take but with uh, you. please join me in thanking Nick. So thank you all for being here tonight. The Imprints and Impression ex exhibit is open now in Resch Library, and we invite you to visit. Uh, it will be open until November 9th, so please come back often with friends and family. So thank you again. Good night. <laughs>